So we're going to go now to our last presentation of the day. And this takes place at the Bridgeview Pollinator Garden. And the talk is Life and Death on Milkweed. This presentation was created by Mei Chen and it'll be narrated by Klisha Curley. So if you've grown milkweed, you've most likely seen that they become covered in aphids. And in this segment, we'll be seeing what's really happening on milkweed when we're not looking. Mei Chen is a volunteer with the Friends of Sausal Creek. This presentation was created by Mei, who took all of these amazing, amazing photographs, identified the insects, and knows their stories. And it will be narrated by garden tour host and entomologist Klisha Curley. Some of you may have been to Klisha and Joe's beautiful garden in Trestle Glen in past years. The Friends of Sausal Creek work to restore, maintain, and protect the Sausal Creek watershed, which is located in Oakland. Through the Friends, an army of volunteers work to remove invasive non-native species, plant native plants grown in their native plant nursery, control erosion, pick up trash, and more. If you care to volunteer with them or check them out, you can look at sausalcreek.org. One of the Friends' many successful projects has been the creation of a pollinator garden. So let's go now and see what's happening in the garden in Oakland and what could be happening in yours. Let me stop sharing. So hello, Kalisha, how are you? Hello, Kathy, I'm good, good to be back. Nice to have you, beautiful background again. So where are you in your screen there? Um, in the Bridgeview Pollinator Garden in Oakland. Okay. Um, yes, where uh, we gave a little talk from a couple of weeks ago. All right, so why don't we just launch right into it? Okay, I'm going to share. Do I need to stop sharing? Do nope, I need you're to... all good. Okay. okay, share. Okay. Is that good, you see me? You look perfect. Okay, and I, I see a lot of people on the side there, but Maybe I can just ignore that. Anyway, um, so uh, we're back in the Bridgeview Pollinator Garden in Oakland. And in 2015, uh, the native narrowleaf milkweed was planted in the garden to, uh, to bring in butterflies and of course to feed their, uh, their larvae, the caterpillars. Uh, these caterpillars only feed on milkweeds. So uh, it's one of the big reasons we need um, so over several years, May, after these uh, plants were planted, May watched the milkweed plants, and she soon found herself fascinated by um, something besides the monarchs, um, which we will see, and uh, Kathy's already alluded to. So many, uh, milkweed is full of toxic chemicals, and insects that feed on them have evolved to be able to eat them and to accumulate those to toxins in their bodies. And then they use them as a defensive mechanism. Um, they advertise the fact that they're distasteful by uh, their orange and red and black coloration. Um, so you see here a couple of, um, well, actually three kinds of insects that feed on milkweed and they all have this um, striking um, warning coloration. And that gives them some protection from certain predators, especially bird birds. Uh, one of the insects that feeds on milkweed is the so-called oleander aphid. Oleander also has a lot of toxins in it. Um, I may occasionally refer to it as the milkweed aphid. Either way, um, same aphid. Um, and interestingly enough, there are many things that are very happy to feed on these aphids, and uh, that's part of what we'll see today. <clears throat> so this is uh, basically this presentation is May's story of how to control these aphids by doing nothing. Uh, the take home message is wait, watch, and let nature take its course. And you're gonna see that the aphids are gonna bring in many other insects, um, many other what we refer to as beneficial insects that help create a healthy environment um, and a functioning ecosystem that basically takes care of things. May has documented um, feeding on these aphids by several different kinds of insects. Do you see my pointer here? I hope so. Anyway, um, and uh, okay. So the ones that will be that she has documented are uh, uh, include some flies. So these are fly larvae, parasitic wasps, um, a neuropterin or a lacewing larvae, 
uh, this, this guy you know, so milkweeds and their larvae, and another beetle, soldier beetles. Uh, and this is really just the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of food webs, but, um, but all of these things she has found uh, coming into the garden to uh, enjoy, enjoy these aphids that of course, um, at the ba a base of that food web is the plant, the milkweed. Um, so <laughs> uh, this is the kind of picture that uh, tends to give gardeners uh, the willies. Um, and actually, I think it was last weekend, a couple of people mentioned uh, aphids on milkweeds and felt uncomfortable about them. And, you know, beautiful as this is, it, it is a bit, uh, a bit jarring sometimes. Um, and one of the interesting things about aphids is they seem to kind of um, appear overnight. And so I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit, tiny bit about uh, why that is. Um, colonies of aphids consist of all females. So here are adult uh, females. This one is giving birth. So they give birth to a live offspring. There are no males involved. The oleander aphid actually, uh, there are no males known of the oleander aphid. So they can reproduce fine without, or they must reproduce without mating. Um, and then these new little nymphs that are born alive uh, already have inside the, of themselves um, new, um, the next generation of offspring developing. So basically we like to say aphids are born pregnant. As you can imagine, this makes the generation time sort of telescoped and very, um, very short. Uh, and so you can get these very large populations of aphids growing up uh, almost literally overnight. Um, Okay, uh, when the uh, colonies get crowded, the, um, the the, uh, some of the aphids will um, become alate or will have wings so that they can disperse. Um, if the plant gets old, also they will disperse. So um, this colony has now started to make um, some, some winged aphids that can go on and uh, make a new colony somewhere. Um, Here's a picture of, a close-up picture of a winged aphid. And this guy over here, you can see these little shoulders. So this is a, a last stage aphid right before it becomes adults. These, this little shoulder shows that there's, uh, that one is also gonna become a winged aphid. Um, aphids have piercing sucking mouth parts uh, and they insert those mouth parts into the plant tissue to take up plant sap. And in particular, they feed on phloem. Phloem is the very sweet um, and liquidy food. And uh, because they ingest so much sugar and so much liquid, they also excrete a lot of sugar and a lot of liquid. And what comes out the other end is something we refer to as honeydew. So that's basically aphid poop. Um, in this photo, you can also see a milkweed bug. Uh, again, with that um, warning coloration and also with its mouth parts inserted into the plant. But uh, this is just one of, the, one of the many kinds of insects that feeds on, um, on milkweeds. So here is some fresh honeydew that's all over the, um, the plumes, uh, the, the seed plumes. And um, this is fresh honeydew. You can see little droplets. Um, honey honeydew is actually uh, very nutritious because it's so high in, in sugar and it's eaten by birds and mosquitoes, ants and wasps, uh, and uh, over 40 different species of wild native solitary bees have been documented to feed on it. So it is actually a very important food source. You guys probably know also that uh, ants love to eat this stuff and many aphid species are tended by ants um, just so they can um, eat this uh, honeydew. Uh, one of the bad things about honeydew is uh, something else that likes to feed on it, which is a fungus. So sooty mold fungus grows on the honeydew. Um, you get this awful black looking stuff. And this is maybe one of the worst things about ha having aphids or one thing that gardeners don't like about aphids is, is this um, unsightly um, honeydew, it's this black coating you get on the leaves. Uh, so this picture was taken at the height of an aphid, uh, of the aphid infestation in the garden. Um, and so this is a little bit, um, you know, the aphids have been around for a little while. Um, honeydew, by the way, is also the reason you shouldn't park under certain street trees. Um, aphid infested street trees, you will uh, find your car all covered in sticky stuff. 
Um, so the aphid infestations of the garden over the years that May was uh, looking at them, they recurred in successive years. Uh, the narrow leaf milkweed, as I think Kat maybe alluded to, is uh, goes away uh, at the end of the season and then comes back up again. So um, year after year, these uh, narrow leaf milkweeds um, appear and the aphids um, come. They they come right back. Um, and it's not very long before they also have some visitors. So here we have uh, a ladybug who has found uh, this colony. Um, so there are uh, many species of ladybugs in the garden and they very quickly, as I said, found, find the colonies. Uh, this colony has more dead aphids than alive. Um, these, I'll show you a closer up picture in a minute, but all these uh, black carcasses here are dead aphids. And um, also apparent here are these um, white, these white uh, guys here, which are the shed skins of aphids. So when they molt, they leave behind these white stick, these white skins. And it may be because there's honeydew around. Anyway, they they always seem to hang around, um, and you always see these in colonies. So this indicates uh, that this was a a very uh, a populous colony, and uh, that is now being decimated. Um, as we go through the season. Um, here again, closer up are some dead aphids among the living um, and some of these cast skins. So these four uh, species of ladybugs were the first to colonize the garden. And uh, this is a mix of both um, native and introduced species. Uh, Hippodamia convergence here down on the on the uh, bottom left is the one that we see aggregating um, in many in winter in many Bay Area locations. So it's it may be uh, one that you've seen. Uh, it's really wonderful to come across these in in big masses in the winter. Uh, Redwood Park, for example, down by the creek, um, they often aggregate there, and probably you guys have seen them elsewhere. Um, so here's a lady, uh, oh, two more ladybug species that were found in the garden. So a total of six that May has documented. Um, up in the um, upper left is uh, the California lady beetle eating an aphid, um, as as they <laughs> as they tend to do. Um, and what else did I want to say about these? Um, yeah, so six six species of ladybugs that have come in to feed on aphids here. Um, they uh, don't waste any time in uh, reproducing. Uh, these are lady beetle eggs laid on the back uh, side of a, of a um, narrow leaf milkweed leaf. Uh, so if you see these, make sure you, uh, you leave them there because uh, what's going to come out of those are little baby ladybugs. Um, here is that... Um, that cluster of eggs, uh, they have all hatched, now just the shells left, and here's a baby ladybug, a ladybug larva, and another one here, very small, that have not dispersed yet. Um, so they are just about um, to go off and start finding uh, aphids of their own to eat. So it took a few days between that first picture that May took of the eggs, and when she went back, by the way, May goes to the garden virtually every day. And so she can visit sites over and over again. Uh, so a few days after that she noticed those eggs, um, she came back and found that they had hatched. Ladybug larvae, um, many gardeners uh, still don't recognize these and it's very important to recognize these because you really like to have these around. They look like little mini alligators. Uh, they can eat, some species have been documented to eat uh, as a larva maybe two or 300 uh, aphids during their development. So that's, that's pretty good. The, the adults do even better than that. But here you can see uh, one feeding on a winged aphid. So these are a couple of different species of ladybug um, larvae. Uh, another uh, stage of the ladybug that maybe is unfamiliar to gardeners is the pupa. Um, and here we have some sooty mold again. Um, but so this, this orange guy here, that's a ladybug pupa. And again, if you see that uh, on your plants, just let it be because a ladybug is going to emerge from there. Here's one that looks slightly different, uh, but they're fairly recognizable. They're not going to be moving around. They're just a, a little orange blob among the aphids. 
This is a sequence of photos that May took of a ladybug adult um, just emerging, so out of the pupil case. So here it is just starting to pop out, a little further out, uh, down at the bottom left. It's almost all the way out. So here is the adult and here the, um, the pupil case, and now it's finally completely out. Uh, this ladybug has um, extended its, its uh, hind wings, which are membranous, that's how they fly. Uh, so they're extended so they can uh, dry up. And the uh, characteristic forewings of a beetle, they're hard, um, referred to as the elytra, and they also need to dry and uh, darken up and turn into their uh, typical uh, ladybug dark red coloration. Not all of them are dark red, but this one will darken up. So uh, although ladybugs are probably the best known of the beetle predators, or maybe of all the, of all the predators of aphids, um, May has also documented another beetle um, that, and again, she's gotten a great picture of, of this guy uh, feeding on an aphid. This is a soldier beetle in the, the family Cantharidae. Uh, they tend to eat all kinds of soft-bodied insects in the garden. Uh, generally considered very beneficial and um, also very common for people to see and maybe not to know so much uh, what they are. Here's a pair of, of those uh, soldier beetles mating. So here's one, here's the other, and a typical, um, this is how they mate sort of um, back to back, one front to back, whatever, kind of a strange arrangement, but that's, that's how they do it. Um, so again, they, uh, the adults tend to hang around flowers, so they'll eat whatever uh, soft-bodied insects they find there. Uh, the larvae also um, are carnivorous but or predaceous, but we very rarely see those. They tend to be in the soil. Um, we talk about uh, surfid flies, uh, which are bee mimics. Um, often we talk about them as uh, what they do among flowers and they are very, very good pollinators. Um, and um, so here are four surfid flies that May has photographed in the garden. But uh, for our purposes and for this story, what we're really interested in uh, are the surfid larvae. Um, so the adults feed on nectar and pollen uh, but the, uh, the larvae are predators of, again, many soft-bodied insects, but they're really, really great aphid predators. So thanks in part to all the surfids that uh, we have in the garden, uh, there's plenty of, oh, sorry, thanks to the aphids, uh, there are plenty, plenty of food uh, for the many uh, different kinds of surfids uh, that we find in the garden. Um, here's another uh, four species. So May has uh, documented Eight different species, there are probably more, um, but she has photographed these eight and uh, larvae of all eight of those um, do feed on aphids. Um, some surfid larvae feed on other things, but all of these uh, are known to feed on aphids. Um, this I think is a wonderful picture showing a sort of a, a sharing of the bounty. So here is a, a ladybug um, adult who is happily chomping away on aphids in here, and two surfid larvae. Um, sometimes they're a little bit hard to find, but um, here they are all um, sharing. Uh, oh, and here, which I had never noticed before, is another um, phenomenon that we will talk about a little uh, later on, but uh, a lot of aphid control uh, going on here. Um, so uh, right here is a larva of a surfid. Uh, it's got an, a ladybug, uh, sorry, an aphid in its mouth and it basically draining the fluid out of that aphid. Um, and as I said, oh, I didn't say, but these guys can eat um, four to 500 uh, aphids in their lifetimes. So um, again, a very good um, control agent. Um, when you see, so here, here's the uh, surfid larva again. This is the head end, this pointy end is the head end. They're legless, uh, blind, and when you see them casting about looking for prey, it's really kind of um, 
a little bit creepy. Uh, May does have some videos of that and I decided not to show them because um, they even give me a, a, a little bit of the willies. So, uh, so they do cast about with this uh, blind head of theirs uh, looking for uh, aphids and they do, um, they do very well in finding them. Um, so here are some serpids of different species. They all, uh, look somewhat um, different from each other, but they have many things in common. So again, they all have this sort of pointy head, uh, blunt at the end. They are legless, uh, blind, sort of inconspicuous, um, and you know, they're fly larvae, so not entirely attractive. Uh, but they, they do do a great job. Uh, here, this arrow is pointing to a um, a surfid egg. Uh, a female has laid an egg here among the aphids. Um, before uh, becoming adults, the, these um, surfids have to pupate. And uh, so then the last larval uh, instar or stage, uh, the skin becomes a sort of a puparium, a, a covering. Um, and the, uh, the uh, fly will pupate inside of there. It starts out green, later becomes brown, often attached to the, the uh, leaves, but sometimes they fall down into the soil uh, to pupate. But again, here's a, something that might look like a weird thing among your plants, but is uh, something you definitely want to uh, leave there. Um, here's a picture of a um, of surfeit fly a surfeit adult laying an egg. So when you see an insect sort of curving its abdomen around down like that, uh, oftentimes you, you may be watching um, an overposition event or a laying of an egg. Um, and so that's what's happening here. Um, and here is an egg also laid, um, which, a, which an adult has laid. And, and what's really cool is these flies know that they should lay the eggs among aphid colonies because when this uh, egg hatches, uh, there will be food right there for the, uh, for the larva. So um, just want to emphasize again that the, the um, adults are really great uh, pollinators and they're really good in their own right and that the uh, larvae are uh, wonderful um, control agents for many different kinds of soft bodied insects. So surfids are really important um, insects in the garden. May found another uh, fly larva among the aphids. This is an, uh, a midge larva, much smaller than the surfid larva. Um, and uh, the adult, I hope you can see here in the corner, it's a little bit um, off my screen, but here's a picture, one of the few pictures, I think there are only two in here that May did not take, but uh, this is an adult uh, right down here in the, in the corner, um, very inconspicuous, tiny, like a tiny little mosquito, not something you will probably see. But you will find uh, aphid midge larvae among aphid colonies. Um, uh, what do I want to tell you? Oh, so uh, yeah, so the, um, the uh, adults will lay, lay probably again about 100 uh, eggs in their lifetime. So lots of, um, lots of little larvae to, uh, to feed on these aphids. Um, here's a midge larva, again, very small, but very um, capable of taking on an adult aphid. Uh, they inject a venom into them uh, and then just suck out uh, the contents of the aphid. Uh, this aphid has been a little upset by this and is exuding these little droplets out of its cornicles. Um, and there's an alarm pheromone uh, that um, is in that secretion and that does warn other aphids of, of the danger um, of this um, because it's being attacked. Oh, this is a great little uh, video that, uh oh, hello, Ginger. Um, hold on one sec. Joe, yeah. could you get the dog? Uh, sorry. Um, I'm going to show you this video if I can get it started. So this shows another way that aphids uh, tend to de defend themselves. This is sort of a colony defense. They all uh, they kick up their legs and uh, wag their butts, uh, and this is something that they do when they are under attack, and it, it just lets the other uh, aphids know that that something is up. So that's kind of fun. Oops. Um, 
Something uh, quite different uh, is a lacewing larva. You probably have not seen lacewing larvae, but though I think you probably have seen the adults, and I'll show you a picture of an adult in a minute. Um, so these guys are also referred to as um, aphid lions. Uh, again, they are not um, don't necessarily just just eat aphids, but um, they do eat many different kinds of soft-bodied insects, including uh, caterpillars and and so forth. Here's a, a close-up shot of a lacewing larva, and you can see these, where'd my thing go? These fearsome jaws, uh, like little ice tongs, and they will grab the prey with that, um, and again, suck out the contents. Um, up here on the top is a picture of the lacewing adult. Again, this is a picture not taken by May, but one, one of the two that was not. Um, and you've probably seen these uh, flying around perhaps in the garden. Uh, the adults don't necessarily feed on aphids or are not necessarily predaceous. It depends on the species. Many of them just visit flowers um, and uh, take nectar, but the uh, larvae are uh, always predaceous. Okay. Oh, the lacewing eggs are really cool. Um, they are laid on a stalk, so always laid on the end of a stalk. So if you, you see these, we know that a lacewing a larva will, uh, will hatch from there. Um, and it's proposed that they are laid on a stalk um, to protect them from their uh, carnivorous siblings. Lacewings, as soon as they hatch, are very hungry and very active, and they look for something to eat. And apparently, if uh, something to eat happens to be another lacewing larva uh, nearby, they will, or an egg, uh, they will eat that. So, um, so this is uh, thought to be protective of, of the eggs. Um, so uh, this is, uh, this is uh, the, the um, well, I don't even know what to call it. It's not really an organism. Anyway, these are referred to aphid mummies. It's what I saw in the picture uh, before that I said I'm going to tell you more about. Among the absolutely most important um, control agents of aphids and of many other insects are parasitic wasps. Uh, and parasitic wasps will lay eggs in, uh, in their hosts and develop inside. And so these brown, papery looking or sort of puffed up uh, aphids uh, have been have a, a, a wasp developing inside of them, and we refer to them um, as aphid mummies. Uh, here's a, a closer up view of an aphid mummy. So again, they all have this sort of they they just don't look right. They're uh, brown and big. Uh, when you see those among your plants, you should be really happy. Uh, so um, the adult uh, wasps. Um, they feed basically on sugary stuff, so they'll feed on honeydew, they'll feed on nectar and so forth, but their offspring must develop inside, uh, in this case, an aphid. So the female will lay an egg in the aphid, the, the uh, larva of the wasp will develop completely inside that aphid, um, and then, okay, this one also May did not take, so we're up to three, but uh, the... Um, Adult will chew her way out, or his, but they often are females. Um, they have more females than males, actually. Chew a perfectly round hole uh, in the aphid and come out. So you can imagine how small uh, this adult wasp is. Very, very small to de uh, develop its entire life and become an adult uh, inside an aphid. Another great picture uh, of an aphid mummy. Uh, so if you see an aphid colony with mummies uh, among them, that's, that's great. Uh, if you see them with emerged holes, also great. But it is also one of the reasons you don't want to just be knocking aphids off necessarily, um, not without looking carefully because um, you don't want to disturb um, the, the uh, wasps that are developing here. Another great picture of sharing. So here is uh, a um, soldier beetle, a ladybug larva, sorry, lady beetle larva, uh, and uh, surfid larva all feeding, uh, sharing the bounty here. Um, okay. Oh, I did wanna say about that. 
hold on. Um, that this, this picture showing a lot of different natural enemies together feeding on aphids uh, just made me think um, about the fact that we often, uh, th that it's, it's a common practice to bring uh, natural enemies into various places, mainly greenhouses and crops uh, to control insects. Um, but I just wanna emphasize again that all of these insects have come in on their own, uh, brought in, oops, sorry, brought in by these aphids. Uh, they hone in on the uh, damage that's done to the plant sometimes. There are other ways that they find them, but uh, they've all come here naturally. Um, again, you can buy various um, biocontrol agents. Uh, I'd say the most controversial among those are the ladybugs, and uh, we generally don't um, recommend doing that because it does environmental harm, and, and also they're not very uh, useful in controlling. Uh, when you bring in adults especially, they tend to disperse. So just another as uh, an aside I wanted to make here. Um, so we celebrate lady beetles, we celebrate uh, surfid larvae um, because they eat aphids and we don't like aphids. Uh, but I like to think more about um, there not being really good bugs and bad bugs, but just about how interesting the various um, associations are that go on in a garden. And this is a really particularly interesting one uh, that May, I think, was very lucky to find and to photograph. This is a bizarre phenomenon of a ladybug uh, who has been parasitized by a wasp again, and who's now standing guard over that wasp's cocoon. So a wasp laid an egg in this ladybug. It developed inside. It came out. It spun a cocoon. And with the help this is what's proposed, but I think it's probably true because we know that in other situations with the help of a virus is sort of controlling the behavior of this, of this uh, ladybug who sort of stands there and twitches a bit, sometimes referred to as a zombie um, and protects the ladybug, uh, sorry, the wasp um, that is developing inside. When the uh, wasp emerges as an adult, actually I've read that some of these aphids uh, actually um, recover. Um, so maybe 20-25% of them actually recover, the rest die. But it's just a, a fascinating uh, story um, that May has able, was able to capture here. Here's another parasitic wasp. I told you parasitic wasps are, are really um, a really important um, environmental, sorry, ecologically in terms of um, taking care of other insects. Um, and there are lots and lots of species of them. But this is a very large one. It seems to be looking for something among uh, the aphids. Um, it is um, obviously too big to develop inside of an aphid, so it's looking for something else. Um, here it is, again, among an aphid colonies. It turns out it's a type of ichneumonid wasp, which is a parasitic wasp uh, that parasitizes surfid larvae. Um, and here it is among the aphids, searching, searching, where is that surfid? I know that aphids are a good place to find surfid larvae. I don't see one here, uh, and you're not gonna find it, see it finding one, but um, this is its strategy, is to go among aphids and look for its prey. Uh, the aphids are kind of kicking their butts up a little bit, but don't seem particularly alarmed by this. Um, maybe they know this is this guy is uh, not not gunning for them. Um, May has been uh, posting more pictures from the garden this year, and she's got a lot of these guys now. So the, this wasp um, is is um, making a lot of visits to the garden, looking for surfid larvae now. Oops. Well, that basically uh, brings us to the end. Um, what did I want to tell? Oops, I'm sorry, I got myself. A little discombobulated here. Um, oh yeah, so I know I had a note about this. This this uh, picture was taken in June um, of last year. So this is sort of after the aphids have done their main thing. Uh, this is a milkweed plant that is blooming profusely, very happy. It's gotten over its uh, aphid problems. Uh, the aphids are mostly gone. Most of the predators are also gone. Uh, so you've seen sort of condensed over a few years of her taking pictures, sort of the, the season uh, of what has happened uh, through the milkweeds. And uh, they have, they have uh, almost none the worse for wear. Um, 
Aphids do cause problems sometimes, especially agriculturally, but in many cases, um, they basically um, don't do a whole lot of damage. Um, this year, with the arrival of more um, narrow leaf milkweed, which has emerged again, uh, the aphids are back. This picture was taken in early May of this year, uh, and the whole process has started over again. And this is an interesting picture because we see adults and very young larvae, so not so much a mixed a mix of different ages, but um, that will that will be coming um, a little later. Here's the picture I showed you before, but I just want to uh, show you that I added a couple of other insects. So the parasite of the surfid, the parasite of the uh, lady beetle, and again, still just the tip of the iceberg in terms of, of what's going on there. Um, I just uh, would like to emphasize again that maybe we shouldn't be thinking about good bugs and bad bugs because maybe you're thinking, oh, that's a bad bug because it eats the surfid, which I want to eat the aphid. but um, but maybe think more about this as a whole complex of, of fascinating interactions and all of them uh, important. Um, so again, uh, take home message. Um, if you want natural control of aphids uh, and of other insects in your garden, here are some do's and don'ts. So think about trying to tolerate some of what you consider pest insects because they do support um, a whole variety of other things. Um, I'm sure this is preaching to the choir, but don't use pesticides, especially, uh, they're especially dangerous for many kinds of natural enemies, uh, which are very sensitive to them. And uh, maybe most importantly, enjoy the natural processes that come along with uh, planting native plants, uh, because they support a huge variety of insects, all of them kind of doing stuff together. Um, and it's just fascinating to watch. Um, and I don't think, uh, oh, eventually the monarchs will be back. <laughs> um, we'll leave the last word to Lao Tzu. Um, and this, this is something that May put up, so I decided I should share it at the end. Uh, but basically, um, yeah, that's it. All right, Klisha. I'll you. stop sharing. Yes, if you stop sharing, and then I think I will talk with you for just a moment, and I'm gonna say, okay. Thank you so much. That was terrific. I really enjoyed it. Good. I, uh, like most of you, when I saw aphids on my milkweed some years ago, I was horrified and I would try to hose them off or get soapy water or take a paper towel and close my eyes and run it up and down the stem. But then a couple of my garden tour hosts told me that one that they, she grew milkweed um, because it attracted the aphids, which brought in insects and brought in birds. And another one told me she grew sacrificial milkweed, meaning she just grew enough of it that she just didn't really care what happened. And then I realized with my own milkweed that I should just leave it alone. And when I did, the ladybugs came in. I remember one day going out to the garden and seeing nine ladybugs at a glance on the milkweed. And my husband said they were hoovering, like a hoover vacuum. <laughs> they were hoovering up and down the stem and you could see where they had been. There were these like trails where there were no aphids. And I realized after that, that I should really just leave them alone. And ever since then, I, I don't do anything in my yard. Whatever happens in my yard happens in my yard. And uh, and we haven't used pesticides for 30 years, which has been, you know, wonderful for us and our family. I'm going to say, uh, Klisha, thank you so much for giving this presentation. And if you see May before I do, I'm sure you will. Will you thank her also for preparing it? Really? And I'm going to go now. And Klisha, would you stay and answer questions on Zoom? If I can figure out how to do that, I will. So I just go to the chat. Yeah, you just go to chat and click on it. A little box mm -hmm. will pop up and you go down to the very bottom and okay. you'll be able to type and you can scroll up and down and see questions that came in before. And I'm gonna leave the uh, chat line running for a few minutes okay. uh, after I've officially ended the tour. So you can chat away if you like. So Krisha, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Kathy. All okay. right, so to close out the tour now, Uh, the East Bay Green Home Tour is June 6 and 13. You can register for it at eastbaygreenhome.com. My own garden will kick the tour, my own home will kick the tour off on June 6th at 10 a.m. I'd like to thank again the major sponsors of this year's tour, the Alameda County Flood Control and Water Conservation District, 
the Contra Costa Clean Water Program, and the Contra Costa Water District, all of which have funded the tour since it began in 2005. I'd also like to thank our community sponsors for continuing to fund the tour. The tour couldn't be run without their help. I'd like to thank my husband, Mike May, for helping with the technical aspects of the tour. I could not hold this event without him. I'd like to thank Stephanie Proigel, who helped with the planning and coordination of the tour, kept an eye on the details, oversaw coordination with the garden ambassadors, and cheered me up and on. It's been a pleasure, Stephanie, working with you on this event. I'd like to thank the, our, our Zoom Zarina, Jessica Dickinson Goodman, who handled the live technical aspects of the tour so calmly and expertly. Jessica, you were a marvel. Finally, thanks, uh, thank yous are due to the Garden Ambassadors who staff to the Zoom and YouTube channels. I'd like to thank particularly Robin Mitchell, who was answering questions uh, every hour of this four day long event, and Hope, Hope Salzer, who jumped in today to help us uh, as a Garden Ambassador, and also Jana Choi, Martha Griswold, Sung Dong Kwong, and Joel Lim, who also helped answer your questions. It has been a pleasure coordinating this virtual tour for you. I hope it has inspired you to begin incorporating native plants into your own gardens or to incorporate more if you already have natives in your garden. I hope you'll email me and let me know what changes you'll be making in your garden. I'd love to hear from you. If you live in Alameda or Contra Costa counties, I hope to have your own gardens on the tour one day. If you live in Santa Clara or San Mateo counties, you have your own going native garden tour and you could offer your garden for their tour. I will leave the chat stream running for uh, the next few minutes so you can continue chatting if you like, but I will now uh, say goodbye and thank you very much for watching us.